Good morning, church family and friends and those watching in your living room or listening in your car through your iPhone. Bless you. We're so glad to have you here this morning. Let's take a moment and sing some praises to our Lord and Savior. When the music fades, when all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart.
to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Come on, let the neighbors hear you. Bless the Lord of oh my soul. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and blessed are all those who mourn, they will be comforted, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth and blessed are all those who thirst for righteousness they are the ones who will be filled evermore filled forever
carry more and great can be his reward for you and me. Yeah. Blessed are the merciful. They'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. And blessed are the ones who bring peace. They will be called children of God. And blessed are the ones who endure persecution, living for all that is right. Theirs is the kingdom. And when they are falsely accused, they can rejoice evermore rejoice yes for oh, great is there His reward for you and me. Oh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are all those who mourn, they will be comforted. Good morning, Berean family. Welcome back. Uh, grateful for your attention and your uh, presence here in our Berean news feed. Uh, excited to be back in. As you turn to Matthew chapter 5, that's where we're going to be. Let me say this. I hope many of you right now are gathered together in your Acts groups. Uh, if for whatever reason uh, you're not aware of what an Acts group even is, I sent an email out to Covenant members uh, this past week letting us know really moving forward uh, in this down season, how we're going to continue to try to meet together in much smaller groups in homes. Uh, so check that out. I uh, hope many of you are gathering together this morning uh, just to be together, to watch the sermon, to be edified in that. Um, and we're just going to continue to look to the Lord uh, to bring us together in this odd uh, season that we find ourselves in. So Matthew chapter 5, that's where we're going to be. The good life part 2, we're going to look at the second half of the Beatitudes. Um, this morning. And as we, as you were turning there, let me say this. I can remember as a kid, uh, The Twilight Zone. Y'all remember that show, maybe the reruns of that. Uh, the Twilight Zone was a mixture. It was kind of like a science fiction, suspense, horror, a psychological thriller. And they had all these different sketches and episodes. And, and there was one episode of The Twilight Zone 
that there was an astronaut that had flown out to space. And at some point while he's out in space, he's knocked unconscious. And he awakens back on earth. He doesn't know how he got there. He doesn't know what took place. Uh, but he wakes up and at first he thinks everything is normal and everything is right. And very quickly he begins to discover that even though the people and the places are the same, the world that he lives in, everything is backwards. It's kind of like this bizarro world uh, that things aren't right. He's noticing subtleties that are radically different than the earth that he once left. Well, in many regards, that's kind of like the Beatitudes. Uh, you may uh, think that as you read these, this is kind of like a bizarro world. Jesus is talking about the blessed life. Over and over again, this is what he says. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. He's giving us a picture of what the good life looks like in the kingdom. And yet, this bizarro world of Jesus is completely upside down. right? So nobody thinks of a blessed life as being poor but somebody that's rich. Nobody thinks a blessed life is somebody that's sad and mourning. We think of it typically as somebody that's happy. Nobody thinks of a blessed life being hungry. We think of a blessed life as being full and having everything that we need. And yet, uh, Jesus gives us a radically different picture uh, of what that looks like. And, uh, you know, give you another show, another illustration. Uh, when I was growing up, one of my favorite shows was The A-Team. And I love to watch The A-Team because in about an hour you would get that whole episode. But the, the tragedy of the A-Team was every once in a while you would have that episode where uh, five minutes before the show was supposed to end, you would realize, oh my goodness, you know, they just knocked B.A. Barakas out and the, the bad guys have him and they're not going to wrap this episode up uh, in five minutes, which means it's going to be continued for the next week. Uh, in a lot of regards, what they would do, you'd go to that next week and then they'd have a little two-minute synopsis of the week before. Well, as we jump into part two, the last four Beatitudes, let me give you kind of a little synopsis of the Beatitudes that we learned last week that I think will help us as we think about uh, things this week. So number one that we learn about the Beatitudes is this, that, that the Beatitudes are for insiders, not outsiders. So at the beginning of chapter five, we realize Jesus is actually only speaking to his disciples now we find out that actually the, the, the larger crowd is kind of eavesdropping and, and listening in, but the, the key to understanding the Sermon on the Mount and especially the Beatitudes is to understand that Jesus is speaking to insiders. He's speaking to Christians, to followers of, of Jesus, to disciples. He's not talking to skeptics or atheists or people that are trying to figure out who this Jesus is. He's laying out priorities and values of the kingdom. Secondly, not only are the Beatitudes for insiders and not outsiders, the Beatitudes are for all Christians, not a few Christians. Here's what I mean by that. Oftentimes what we do with the Beatitudes is we seem to look at some of these and we say, oh, well, listen, I'm, I have uh, the Beatitudes 3 through 7, you know, but I'm missing 1, 2, and 8. Uh, and we kind of segregate those. We, we kind of look at that and say, oh, well, maybe this is for some elite group of Christians, and rather, what we see is actually the Beatitudes are what every Christian should be. Every Christian should have all of these Beatitudes as a part of their life. So it's not some elite group. What we're talking about here is low-level, bottom-rung Christianity, what every Christian should have in their life. So the Beatitudes are for insiders, not outsiders. For all Christians, not just a few Christians. Third is this, that the Beatitudes are supernatural, not natural. To understand the Beatitudes at their core is to understand how completely unattainable they are left to ourselves. Uh, sometimes uh, kids are born, they're brought into a family, and we say, man, that kid just has a calm disposition, a peaceful disposition. I want you to understand, nothing that Jesus says here is natural to us uh, in our humanly nature. Rather, everything to understand about the Beatitudes is how supernatural they are. Nobody left to themselves mourns their sin. Rather, we want to ignore our sin or coddle our sin. Uh, nobody is naturally uh, spiritual beggars before the Lord and poor in spirit. Rather, we kind of think of ourselves as being pretty good. We may say, oh, I'm a sinner, but, you know, I've, I'm pretty much got it together. I'm kind of a, a, one of the good guys. Uh, so none of these things are natural to us. They're supernatural to understand them. So... For insiders, not outsiders. For all Christians, not a few Christians. They are supernatural, not natural. And then the last one I would say is this, that the Beatitudes are progressive 
and not stagnant. Here's what I mean by that. I had a hard time trying to figure out how to describe this. But they're progressive, meaning they build on one another. There's a, a sequence and an order to which Jesus gives these beatitudes, to which if you were to take uh, one of these beatitudes away, the ones that come behind it wouldn't make much sense. That There's a kind of progression that goes into it. Uh, now, here's what's amazing. The first four Beatitudes that we saw last week, they kind of look at their relationship, or rather our relationship with God, to be poor in spirit, mourning sin, to be meek and hungry for righteousness. The last four are really more about our relationship to fellow mankind, merciful, uh, peacemakers, right? All of these things that we see in the last four. So, uh, that's where we're picking up. Uh, the last four Beatitudes, we're going to be in verses 7 to 12. So if you have your copy of the Scriptures, uh, you can jump along with me as I read here. Beginning in verse 7, here's what Jesus says. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Berean family, this is God's Word. As we begin, we're going to see four truths in this passage, four pictures of the good life, and here's the first one that we see beginning in verse 7, and that is this, that the good life is only for merciful people. The good life is only for merciful people. Now, in verse 7, there's a problem that's created, and that is, notice Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, what, is, what does Jesus mean when he says that? Some people think what Jesus is saying is, listen, you better be merciful, because if you're not merciful, uh, I'm not going to save you. I'm not going to rescue you from your sins. And as a result, they think that what Jesus is talking about here is some works-based righteousness that Jesus responds to us simply because we're being merciful to other people. But that's not at all the case. Uh, remember, Jesus is already talking to insiders, to Christians, to followers of Jesus that have a relationship with Him. He's not saying that this, there's something we have to do. The Gospel is clear. The New Testament and the Scriptures are clear that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, that's non-negotiable. It's clear that we see that. Rather, what Jesus is talking about, again, is this progression. He's saying, listen, if you're poor in spirit, if you mourn your sin, if you're meek, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be merciful. There's a progression that, that's going on here. We, we can't claim to have the receive the mercy of Christ, the mercy of God, and yet ourselves not show that mercy to other people. So if you remember in Matthew chapter 18... Uh, Jesus tells a parable of the unmerciful servant. So here was a guy that owed a debt. He owed a million dollars, and his boss came back to him, and he said, listen, I know you owe me a million dollars. I'm going to forgive that debt. You don't have to pay it. And he was so thankful, so gracious, and he left all happy and excited. And when he was on his way home, he bumps into a friend that owed him 20 bucks. And he says to his friend, hey, you owe me 20 bucks. And the friend says, man, I just can't pay it. And he beats him, and he's angry, and he throws him in jail as a result of that. And, and understand, the point of that parable was to say, here's somebody that doesn't get grace. Here's somebody that doesn't get mercy because of the way that he's responding after being forgiven this great debt. And the gospel's the same way. If we understand our debt before the Lord, what he's done, it will make us merciful. So here's the question, what then is mercy? Because sometimes we think of grace and mercy as being the same thing, but they're really different. So let me, let me describe it like this. Grace deals with sin. Mercy deals with pain and misery. Grace deals with the undeserving. Mercy deals with the miserable. So really what mercy is, mercy is kind of like the tangible down-to-earth response to help somebody in need who's been broken down either because of their sin or because of the sin of living in a fallen world. Mercy wants to come alongside and say, how can I help you? How can I minister to you and, and meet a need? Uh, best example in the scriptures that I know of in regards to mercy is the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. I'm sure uh, most of us know this parable, but if you remember, Jesus says, after telling the parable, 
which one of these was a better neighbor? And if you remember the, the religious man that asked the question at the beginning, he says, well, I suppose the one who had mercy on him. Notice the word that he used. It was the merciful one, the Samaritan who showed mercy to this man lying there in the ditch that was the one who was the neighbor, the friend who showed mercy from that standpoint. Jesus would define gospel-centered mercy as this. This is what the parable is teaching us. Follow. Biblical mercy, according to the Good Samaritan and what we see in other parts of, this, of the New Testament, biblical mercy is when, at great cost to myself, I humbly serve someone who is racially, religiously, and morally different from myself. Let me say that again. Here's a good definition of biblical mercy. Biblical mercy is when at great cost to myself, I humbly serve someone who is racially, religiously, and morally different from me. That's what the Good Samaritan is teaching. The Samaritan was a man racially different than the Jewish man lying in the ditch. The Samaritan was supposed to be enemies with this Jewish man. There was racial contention, and yet... He crossed a racial barrier to meet the need. Notice he was also religiously different. Samaritans were considered heretics. They rejected the Hebrew Scriptures. They rejected the Hebrew Bible. And yet, here's somebody religiously different that crossed that line to minister and be merciful to the Jewish man. Not only that, morally, the Samaritans were different. Morally, because a Samaritan person was the result of an immoral relationship they were considered impure by Jewish standards. And so here's the Samaritan, religiously, racially, and morally, that crosses all those lines to minister to this man in need. So let's put it in a modern day context. What is Jesus talking about? What does real mercy look like if we understand the gospel and grace and, and we understand the mercy that's been shown to us? Well, think about this. Let's say a month ago, uh, you were having to drive through downtown Atlanta and you were having to make a business stop. And let's say at the exact same time, you knew that in downtown Atlanta, there were protests and riots and groups meeting. You had police trying to, to, to scour the city. You had uh, Black Lives Matter that were down there protesting. You had other religious groups meeting and protesting. And you had riots going on. And you had, uh, say, white uh, nationalists that were down there, racist, that were causing unrest and problems. And you were nervous. And, and you're driving through the city. And you make a turn. And as you turn, you notice that in the corner of the ditch, there's a man bloodied and left for dead, right? Now, let me pause here in a second, and, and let's apply this first to my white brothers and sisters. Let's say you're a, a white man or a white woman, and you, you round the corner, and there lying in the ditch is a black man. And the black man lying in the ditch uh, has clutched under one arm a Black Lives Matter flag, and clutched under his other arm is a gay pride flag. The t-shirt that he wears, it's now bloodied and stained, is, it says, Joe Biden for President 2020. Now, white brothers and sisters, what would your response be in that moment? Now, I may be talking in generalities, but I think there are a lot of people, religious or not, that would see a person like that laying in the street and, and kind of have a sense of glee, a kind of sense of come up, come up it's, that would say, well, listen, he was probably a writer. He deserves what he's getting. Jesus would say biblical mercy would stop the car, pull out, r run to this man to check on him, bring him into your car, drive him down to Grady, say to the people that are at Grady, listen, I don't know if he has health insurance or not, but if he doesn't, I'll foot the bill. You see, if our hearts don't go there, church, we don't understand biblical mercy. And you understand the roles could be reversed. So let's say you're a, a, one of my black brothers or sisters and you're in the car and there you are and you round the corner and there laying face down, bloodied, left for dead, is a white man. And not just a white man, he's a skinhead. And on the top of his bloodied head is a red MAGA hat. And clutched under his arm is a Confederate flag, a, a, a rebel flag. And not only that, uh, you can tell... Uh, he's somebody that's been a part of these riots and trying to fight all the, 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 the black people that are either peacefully protesting or, or a part of the other movements that are going on there. And, and what is your heart you see in that? Is your heart looking at this 
this man that's there and saying, well, listen, he had it coming to him. He's a part of the problem, the racism that exists in his heart. Or would your first impulse to be to run out, to, to mercifully check on him, to pick him up, to throw him in your car, drive him down to Grady, to say, I don't know if he has insurance or not, but I'll be willing to foot the bill. That's biblical mercy that we see all throughout the Scriptures. You see, if you understand the Gospel, friend, you understand this, that grace and the Gospel makes you merciful. It makes you missional. Religion will make you tribal. Religion will say, I'm only going to reach out and befriend those that look like me, that act like me, that maybe are racially and religiously and morally the same as me. The Gospel will have you look at other people and say, I was in their exact same shoes until the Lord rescued me. That's the gospel. The gospel is that you and I were dead in our sins, and if Jesus Christ hadn't shown us mercy, and at great cost to himself, bore our penalty and our burden, we would have been lost. We would have died in our sin. Notice Romans 5, 8, Paul says, God demonstrated his love in us, or his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus wasn't waiting around for us to get on his side. We were enemies of God, and yet grace and mercy found us. Has mercy transformed your heart, church? Has grace and mercy transformed you to where when you see your fellow man, your fellow brother, that you don't look at where they are racially or religiously or morally. It's just a matter of here is a, a brother or sister in need, and I want to meet that need in mercy. So the good life is only for merciful people. Number two, the good life is only for pure people people in verse 8. So look at what Jesus says there in verse 8. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Here's the problem with Jesus. Here's the problem with Christianity and the gospel, and that is this. Jesus always begins with the heart. The pure in heart. Not just pure. Not just morally on the outside of our lives that we look like we've got ourselves put together. But Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart. This is the difference between religion and morality and the gospel and grace. Religion and morality is just about externals. It, religion and morality is about cleaning yourself up on the outside. The gospel is about getting down to root issues in the heart. The gospel is the inside out. It's a transformation of the heart that leads to actions that mirror who Jesus is. Religion is about trying to deal with things externally, but it, they never get to the heart. That's the problem. So when Jesus talks about blessed are those that are pure in heart, the Hebrew concept of the heart is not just a place of emotions. That's what we think of in the American context. We think of emotions, what we love. But in, in Jewish thought, in Hebrew thought, the heart was the center of a person's mind. It was the center of a person's will. It was the center of a person's emotions. It was all of those things kind of wrapped up together. So Jesus would say in Matthew 15, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, and so on, and so on, and so on. In other words, uh, the heart thinks about things and wants things. The heart sets a will against things or walks towards certain things. That's what Jesus is saying there. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And yet, Jesus says, how convicting is this? Only the pure in heart will see God. Now, here's what's fascinating. If you look at this passage, there's debate uh, scholars debate what exactly is Jesus talking about with this pure in heart. And it's more... It's more than just kind of a moral purity, although it encompasses that. So, for example, in Psalm 24, uh, the psalmist writes this. He says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? Listen. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood. Hmm. In other words... There's something unique about Psalm 24 that gets at what we see throughout the rest of the Scriptures as it relates to being pure in heart. Being pure in heart, then, is not just about moral purity, though it encompasses that. Rather, what we're seeing in, in Psalm 24 is about having an undivided heart. Notice there's a, a contrast between having cleansed hands and a pure heart. It's having an undivided heart, a heart that hasn't lifted up its soul to another. 
to falsehood. It's a picture of idolatry. In other words, a pure heart is a single focused heart that sets its attention and its focus and its affections on God through Christ Jesus, and it's not divided by the other idols in the world that are being offered. That, that's the point that we see here. So an, a, a religious phony is somebody that comes to church that talks a lot about Jesus, that talks a lot about being saved and, and reconciled to God, and yet, deep down, they really live for money. Deep down, they really live for their career. Deep down, they really live for a relationship or a family, or whatever it is. Their peace, their comfort, their security, their identity is found in an idol other than Jesus Christ. And so what we see here is this picture that a pure heart is a singular heart. It's not divided. So that's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now, he applies this. Notice he goes on to say, you cannot serve both God and money. In other words, Jesus looks at this picture and he says this. Listen, you've got to have a singular heart to serve the Lord because if you're not serving the Lord, you're always going to serve something else. Idols rule and reign in our heart when we're not devoted towards Christ. So here's the question. When we look at our lives, uh, let's take money, for example. If, if somebody were to open up your checking account, your savings account, your 401k, so whatever it is, if they open those things up, would there be a picture of a heart devoted towards Christ? Is there a picture in your finances and your money that would say, Jesus Christ rules and reigns, and my devotion is first and foremost to Him, not making money? Hmm. Or if you're a businessman, do your coworkers, do people around you know there are boundaries that you won't cross? There are corners that you won't cut? There are, there's a faithfulness to Christ that you want to have in your business dealings that you're not going to be compromising in any other way. Are there things about your family? Do, do, do your family members, do, does your spouse or your children, your parents, your aunts and uncles, whoever it is, do they know uh, there are commitments that you have towards Jesus that trump everything else in your life? Is there an undivided heart that you and I have towards Christ, towards the gospel? So, the good life is only for merciful people. The good life is only for pure people. Third, the good life is only for peacemaking people. Look at verse 9. Peacemaking people. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, here's what's amazing again. So, commentators and theologians have noticed that there's kind of a... Uh, there is a progression to these... Beatitudes, but there's also kind of a parallelism between the first four Beatitudes and the last four Beatitudes. And what they've noticed is the first four directly relate to the last four. So for example, they would say, if you have a person that's poor in spirit, that's a spiritual beggar, then that means they will be merciful because they understand their need and they understand everybody else in the world is under the same need, so they'll be merciful to those around them. Or what about this? Number two is those that mourn their sin. If you really do mourn your sin, that then will mean that you'll be a person that's pure in heart, undivided in your attention and your devotion towards Jesus, which means meekness correlates with peacemaking, right? So if I'm a meek person, that means I have no rights. I'm humbled before the Lord and before other people. I'm teachable. I'm non-demanding. I'm, I'm not asserting. I demand no special rights, no special privileges, no special recognition. I'm meek, I'm humble, and as a result, I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm going to consider others more important than myself. Is this what we see, church? in my heart and in my life? Is this what we see in our church at Berean? Colossians 3.15, Paul says this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let me say that again. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Now, sometimes people read Colossians 3.15 and they think when Paul says, 
let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. They think it's some warm, fuzzy feeling, right? They think it's some internal condition, but rather, notice Paul is not talking about some internal feeling that you get. The peace of Christ that rules, he says, is being a part of one body and being called to peace with one another. It's a corporate kind of unity and peace and harmony that's there. Now, here's what's fascinating to me. Have you noticed, church, the sad tragedy in so many churches in America is this, that oftentimes churches that are Bible-believing, churches that claim to love to preach about Jesus and preach about the cross are oftentimes some of the most angry, divisive, strife-filled churches that exist. And friends, these things don't measure up. They ought not be in any way, shape, or form together. Paul is saying the peace of Jesus must rule in every church. We have to be peacemakers to understand the gospel. That Jesus Christ reconciles us both to God and to fellow man. So Ephesians chapter 2 says that because of the Christ, the dividing wall... Because of the gospel, the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile has been knocked down. Racial tensions have been knocked down because Jesus not only brings unity between God and man, but between man and man. So are we peacemakers? Do we reveal that peace and unity in the church with one another? That's what we're seeing here. Paul is ultimately telling us two things about peace and harmony. Number one, he's saying this, that peace must be a priority. Let the peace of Jesus rule. That's what he says. Let it rule. It has to be a priority, which means if peace and unity and harmony are a priority of every Christian in the church, that means by nature, here's what can't be a priority. Me. My wants. My desires. My preferences. My opinions. My politics. My convictions cannot be the priority. Rather, My priority is saying this, what can I do that will foster and stoke the flames of unity and harmony within a church? Peace must be a priority. But the second thing I think that Paul would say too, notice he says the peace of Jesus must rule. In other words, Jesus sets the parameter for what peace is and is not. Jesus sets the boundaries for peace. There is a kind of peace that's a pseudo-peace. It's a peace that's cowardly, that doesn't take a stand on truth, that doesn't take a stand on the gospel, and it compromises, and as a result, there's no real peace. So on the one hand, we could say, well, listen, if we lose the gospel, we lose real peace. So number one, we have to prioritize evangelism and the gospel, and we prioritize sharing our faith with others, knowing that as we share the gospel, it may make some people angry, Jesus himself, in a bizarre sense of uh, this bizarre world, once said, I did not come to bring peace but, but the sword and conflict. What did he mean by that? He, he meant that he understood that when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that will offend people. He, he knows when he says, I'm the only way to the Father, that that will offend people. He knows when he says that, no, 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 you need to understand you're a spiritual beggar that has nothing. You're a sinner in need of grace. That message is offensive. And so there are times, church, where when we speak the truth, it will be offensive and people won't like it. But there's no other peace. So on the one hand, a Christian is somebody. We're we're not martyrs. We're not picking a fight. Sometimes Christians just look like people that go around. They're the, they're the moral police. They're religious police. They're the theological police. They're just looking to attack everybody. A Christian is not that. A Christian is doing everything in his power to maintain peace and harmony, and yet, when push comes to shove, they know Jesus sets the boundaries for peace, what real peace is. They know that the gospel remains the priority in every kind of community, and they're going to be faithful first and foremost to Jesus. So the good life is only for merciful people. It's only for pure people. It's only for peacemaking people, number three. Fourth and finally, here's where we end. The good life is only for persecuted people. For persecuted people. Look again at verses 10 to 12. Blessed are those, Jesus says, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when all kinds of 
Or, or blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What a contrast to this bizarro world that Jesus presents. In this bizarro world, the good life is about being persecuted. This is a kind of, this is the climax of everything that Jesus is saying, but it really feels like the anticlimax, doesn't it? It seems odd. And yet, almost, did you notice the last two Beatitudes are really the same? Two different times Jesus says, blessed are you when you're persecuted. Blessed are you when others revile you. He, he has to say it twice because it's almost so shocking to us. Because if you think about it, let's take all of this together as a whole. Jesus is describing a particular kind of person, a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And what do we know about every follower of Jesus? Here's what we know. They, they are a spiritual beggar. They know themselves to be the greatest sinner that they know. They mourn their sin. They hate their sin. They, they see themselves for who they really are, and, and they hate what they've become, their pride, their arrogance, their sinfulness. And yet, they're meek. They're humble. They're non-demanding. They put others before themselves. They seek to submit themselves and obey Jesus Christ. They hunger and thirst after righteousness. They share mercy to those that are around them, to people that are different from them, people that believe differently than them, that are ethnically different, r racially different. Not only that, they're peacemakers. Everywhere they go, they're trying to bring peace and harmony to relationships around us. You would think, church, that you would say, well, my goodness, surely people would just invite this kind of person into their life. They would want this kind of person. And rather, what Jesus says is, if you are all those things, know this, you will not find peace and ease and comfort in this world. You will find persecution. You will be reviled. That's the word that Jesus uses there. You will be maligned and slandered. Jesus says in John 15, 20, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. He says a few verses before that, listen, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Paul says, all that desire to live a life of godliness will be persecuted in this world. In other words, church, you and I will find no allies here. What we will find is the, the further we look to be faithful to Christ, the more trials and persecutions we will find in this world. Notice in verse 11, name calling. Uh, listen, if you're a single person trying to live in purity before the Lord and the boundaries that He set in your relationships, notice this, that the world will hate that. The, the world will look at you and your purity and fidelity to Christ will be, will be seen as a threat to their morality. If you're a businessman or a businesswoman and you refuse to cut corners and you refuse to put in a 20-hour work week and get paid for 40, rather you're going to put in a good week's work and you're going to work hard as to the Lord, uh, you will be seen as a goody-goody to all those around you who are trying to cut corners and not do things the right way. You will be called names. And yet Jesus says, rejoice. We don't rejoice in the fact that persecution is there per se. Notice the rejoicing comes in this. Jesus is saying this, you will be rewarded, Christian, for your faithfulness. And not that the Lord owes us anything. All that we have is from Him. Listen, if, if we find in any way, shape, or form that we are the kind of person that He describes here in the Beatitudes, clearly it's a result not of anything that we've done, but only the grace and the mercy that Christ has worked in us that he who began a good work is working that out in our heart and in our life. So we rejoice knowing that one day, okay, we may suffer in this world, but a reward is coming to us. And then secondly, he says we can rejoice because, guess what? He says, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is what we see, that all that stand for Christ have always been persecuted. First and foremost, church, it is Jesus Christ, the one who was ultimately persecuted. Notice, he was the one who came the perfect picture of the Beatitudes. He was the one that humbled himself, that came as a spiritual beggar, not demanding his rights, humbled himself, emptied himself. Though he was perfect, he didn't have to mourn sin, but he came perfectly and meek and, and served. He, he, he shows us what it looks like to hunger and thirst after righteousness. He shows us what it looks like to be merciful. He shows us what it looks like to be a peacemaker. And he shows us what it looks like to be persecuted. To, to be 
pure in heart, all of these things that encompass Jesus. And, and now He calls us into fellowship with Him, and He invites us to walk in the relationship that He gives us. So here's the question as we bring all this to an end. Does, does Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, describe who you are? Low-level, bottom-rung Christianity. Is this who you are? Can I say this again? We said this last week. If you see only your shortcomings and your failings here, if maybe right now there's conviction that this is not who you are, praise God that we can all go back to step one. Praise God that it doesn't surprise Him to know that you and I are spiritual beggars that left to ourselves can never produce what Jesus calls us to here. Rather, when we admit our need before the Lord, when we mourn our sin, when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus says, I will give you the righteousness that you need. I will give you the heart that you need. So He invites every sinner, no matter what your past, no matter how much you've made a wreck of your life, He invites every sinner into this grace if we would humble ourselves and see ourselves as we are. Church, I hope that's who Christ is making us. As Bereans, first and foremost, that, that, that we have a church filled with the kind of Christian, man and woman, teenagers and children, that look like who Jesus describes here. Let's pray. Father God, we come to You right now grateful. Grateful, Lord, that Your Word shows us, it gives us a standard that Jesus calls us to. But Lord, it's a reminder, we, we can't be this. Lord, if left to ourselves, none of us would be this person, this man or this woman. So Father, what we need right now is, is Your mercy that ministers, that reaches out to us and, and supplies for us what we lack. So Father, if there's someone here right now, maybe they realize they've never repented of their sin to put their faith and trust in You. Father, right now You would save them, reconcile them to God and to You, and that they would be saved and rescued from their sin. Father, if there's someone here today, a Christian, a member of our church, maybe that's just been penetrated this conviction of who you've called them to be and, and how they've failed. Father, I pray that they would only know your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, and that, Lord, they would have a hope of knowing that you'll supply what they need each day moving forward. So, Father, will you continue to build your church right here at Berean? All of this we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church family, I'm grateful for your attention. Before you go, let me remind you of a few things. Don't forget, Sunday, 5 p.m., is our corporate prayer meeting. So we're going to send out a Zoom link. Uh, check your email. I need to resend that. I think I sent one early in our Berean News, but something's going on with that. I'm going to resend that probably either Friday or Saturday with that link. We want you to join us as we pray through Zoom uh, for our church, for our community, for our world. Uh, second, don't forget our Acts groups. Again, I talked about this earlier. Uh, if you didn't get that email with the link, uh, a little video I sent out, man, make sure you get back and you watch that so you can see these Acts groups are ga gathering, really small groups, maybe a family or two just meeting together to watch the sermon, to share a meal, to interact. And then third, don't forget, we launched, uh, gave our, fa our website a facelift, if you will, so you can check that out. Uh, we're actually streaming all of our sermons through our website now, so just click on that, uh, view the, the live link there, and you can see the sermon each and every week. But I'm honored that you're here, blessed that you uh, have been a part. I hope the Lord is changing you, molding you to look like Jesus uh, through this week. Uh, next week, we're going to continue to gather as the Lord continues to show us what He has for us here in the Sermon on the Mount. Bless you, and we'll see you next time.